is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 135 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to, well, me. And this is a special solo show reflecting on what I've learned having finished my third full year of working for myself and writing full time. So yeah, I thought I would do a solo show this week. But first to last week's question, which was, how do you plan? Is it by tax year, calendar year, quarter or something else? And Ian Worrell said, I try to set goals for the year and then for 100 day increments, then weekly and daily. 100 day increments, interesting. Edwin Downman said, I'm supposed to plan. Why doesn't anyone ever tell me these things sooner? (laughs) In truth, I don't plan, but uh, I do what I can as the situation dictates. I'm better with uh, my systems, but overall, my writing life remains a, I'll get there when I arrive. I love that. So this week's question is in the vein of the show. So the question is, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned on your journey so far? The book recommendation uh, of the week this week, don't normally do this, but it's my own fiction book. In fact, I don't think I've ever done this on this show. Uh, But Keepers is currently free because I'm doing an experiment. I'm doing, uh, I'm seeing what free does. I am, I've had a book barb. I have been uh, booking and running other newsletter promos. So I'm trying to see what effect that has, what the read through is like now that the series is complete. So Keepers is young adult fantasy. If you like stories with soulmates, forbid and love, Lovers, murders and mysteries, uh, glamorous balls, ride or die friend squads, school rivals and loads of magic, then this book is for you and I will put links in the show notes to that. And don't forget, it's free! Not going to do a personal update this week, uh, other than to say thank you so much to my co-host Daniel Wilcox uh, for being an amazing co-host for the last two years. We have now recorded the final episode of Next Level Authors and that will air on Tuesday the 26th. Uh, It is for a Thursday the 21st as I record this. So yeah, thank you. It has been a blast. I adore you and may we both go on to achieve fantastic things. Um, So that's it. No personal update this week because you're going to hear from me all freaking episode. So Rebel of the Week this week is Ian Worrell. Ian says, This story involves one of my brother's cats. When he and his wife first got a house, they had three cats and got two adult Scottish terriers. One of the adult cats, being an older one, established herself as the alpha pet. Whenever the dogs or other cats went anywhere near him, oh, sorry, it's a him, they would get a smack in the head. (laughs) I love cats so much. The funny part to this story is uh, that one time the male Scottish Terrier was across the street in a growling match with a German Shepherd. Oh my goodness me. The cat that beat on the dogs and uh, beat on the dogs and the other cats ran across the street and attacked the German Shepherd like he was doing an older sibling type thing. That's my dog. I'm the only one who's allowed to beat him up. Oh my God, that is fantastic. And I bet the fucking cat won too. Oh, this is why I love cats, guys. This is why I love cats. Oh, Oh, that has made my day. If you would like to be a Rebel of the Week, or if your pet is a Rebel of the Week, then please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, something big, something small, something in between. You can email your Rebel story to Becca on the Rebel... Uh, what? Let me give you the correct email address. RebelAuthorPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to returning patron Bear Kloss and to HB Line who upped her pledge as well. Don't forget, for those of you who join at the $5 level, you get access to the Slack community uh, and it is a thriving Slack community as well. So uh, we are running a quarterly challenge and uh, there is a lot of chitter chatter in the Slack group about the quarterly challenge, but I am trying to make sure that I put things up uh, on Patreon. And of course, you've got access to the uh, spreadsheet where you can 
can track everything that you're doing and that they've got information on all the sprints and everything that are going on for members in the Rebel community. So if you'd like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes as well as bonus content, you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. All right. That is it from me this week. I'm going to get on with the episode, which is six lessons from three years of writing full time. I can't quite get over the fact that we are here again. It has been three years since I quit my day job and there is something so bizarre because I still have a very sharp memory of the moment that I told my managers that I was handing in my notice. Those feelings of fear and jumping off the cliff and the leap of faith are still so acute in my mind and my heart. And to think that I am now three years out from that is a very strange sensation. I think when I hit eight years, because that was how long I spent in the day job, it might be another really momentous occasion. But three years feels like I reached a, I suppose, kind of like a safety point or a safety boundary point where I have the faith that I'm never going back. But anyway, I do this every year. Uh, This is now the third uh, annual uh, lessons from, from writing. Uh, full time. And I am going to put into the show notes the links to the lessons from one year of writing full time and the lessons from two years of writing full time. Okay, so lesson one is always the income update. Year one, I've said this before, but always felt like survival for me. I didn't have any faith that I could survive. I mean, I did, of course, because I wouldn't have quit my job if I didn't think I could do it. But there was still a very acute fear that I wouldn't make the bill money, I wouldn't be able to, I don't know, put clothes on my kid or or whatever. Um, And so once I then surpassed that first year, that feeling of really big overwhelming fear shrunk a bit and year two was more about then reducing the freelance work in order to build my own business and I did both of those things I survived and I shrank the freelance this past year was more about continued growth and for me I was chasing my old day job income I really really wanted to beat that income and thank the many and fucking varied gods I did that I beat my income by quite a bit um and so yeah that was a huge achievement and that has had some really significant uh positive impacts on my confidence I think But brutal truth time, when I left my day job, I halved my income. I think you guys probably know that. I I haven't made any uh, 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 secret of that. But because I did that, the effect and impact on me was that I have struggled with my self-worth and my feeling that my decision to leave was right and correct. I I literally halved my income. Like, who the fuck does that? Okay, well, obviously me, apparently. But it was... <laughs> it's Looking back, it seems like a crazy decision to have done that. And, and, like, to have done it when, you know, I had a kid. We had responsibilities. And, like, yeah, okay, sure. The high of saying fuck you to the corporate world was... For sure, like a delirium induced ecstasy chasm or something. Like, it was crazy. But just like everything else, I had a massive fucking come down too. And I genuinely feel that that is what the last two years have been. They have been full of doubt. Um, You know, I would constantly berate myself, like, what if I couldn't grow my income? What if I never earned a decent salary again? What if I couldn't surpass the ceiling of my old day job income? So, like, I, I, you know, I've said that year one was crippling fear. And in year two, I learned that self-belief was important. But I still 
feel like I was holding myself back. Like there were some self-limiting beliefs around money because I didn't know if I could surpass my old day job income. And I got relatively close last year, but I didn't do it. And that almost felt like a failure because I'd got close and I'd missed it. And so I think that I needed to prove to myself that the decision to quit my day job was the right one. And of course it was the right fucking one. You can tell that by how happy I am compared to how happy I was before, which was to say I wasn't very fucking happy. But it wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. Just doing it and surviving and paying my bills wasn't enough. Like to use a Clifton strengths term, yes, everyone fucking drink. I had to win against my day job. And and the act of quitting wasn't sufficient enough to feel like a win. Yes, it was a partial win, but it wasn't the win. Um, surpassing my old day job salary, now that was a fucking win. That made me feel like I that my choice was right, that my choice was valid, that it was the right choice because, you know, I had been told I was never going to earn any more in the day job because I I refused to play the political game. I didn't want to be part of the boys club. So that was my ceiling in the old day job. Now I don't have a ceiling. So this passing of my old day job income has made a significant difference to how I feel. It's made a difference to my confidence, to my self-belief. I genuinely feel like there is no cap and no ceiling anymore. And to use a cliche, sorry, I know we're writers and I shouldn't, but fuck it. The sky truly is the limit. Okay. But let's let's look at some figures. Like, I'm not going to tell you exactly what I've earned um, yet. I don't quite feel confident enough to do that. However, I will tell you some figures and some percentages. So overall, my turnover, so my gross turnover was up 35% last year. And net profit was up just uh, like a, a decimal point under 31%. So let's just say it was up 31%. The main difference between, uh, the reason why there was a difference between turnover and net profit is because I increased my outsourcing spend expenditure and I also increased uh, the amount that I invested in advertising. I actually expect the outsourcing expenditure to continue either as it is at the amount that it is or um, hopefully increase because the more I spend on outsourcing, the less I have to do, the more I can work on the important stuff. Um... And so, yeah, I I probably expect that to uh, uh, continue or stay the same or increase. And the advertising for now will continue at the level it is at. And depending on the returns on my investment that I get, it will either uh, reduce or increase. I don't know yet. So looking at the differences between uh, year one and year like to now, the main difference is the reduction in reliance on my freelance income. So when I first quit my day job, I quit because of freelance. I I was very, very miserable. I'd never hidden that and I had to get out of my day, day job. I wasn't really at the point where my personal business could sustain me like my sales and my courses and my speaking, all the rest of it, that wasn't really at the point where that could solely sustain me. So I needed freelance income. Now, of course, freelance is part of my business, right? So that means my business was sustaining me. But I know there's often a lot of um, mystery and shroudedness over uh, what people call full time. For me, full time means working for myself in my business. I don't have to do anything for anyone else if I don't want to, which is what I do. Um, But in year one, my income, uh, my freelance accounted for 75% of my income, right? So I was majority doing freelance work. Today, it accounts for 32%. So that means my business, my sales, my courses, my everything that I do that is solely created by me and generated by me is way above, like that is way the vast majority of my income. 
My aim over the next year or two is to continue shrinking that freelance to the point where it no longer really makes sense to do any freelance. Now, I've always said this. Um, I don't think I've ever made a secret of that. Uh, but I absolutely fucking lutely love the freelance work that I do. So <laughs> leaving is hard on multiple fronts because I love the team. I love the people. I love the work. Uh, I don't really want to leave. <laughs> even though ultimately if I want to continue growing my business at some point I am going to have to do that. The second point to note is that uh, in my first year the everything else bucket so I kind of split my um, it, so there are graphs if you look at this on my website uh, there, there's a transcript and a well a kind of transcript um, and there are graphs and things so you can see the pie charts that I've put and I always split it into three pots because otherwise it would get very granular. So I have book sales, I have freelance and I have everything else. In my everything else bucket in year one, everything else accounted for 8% of my income. Now it accounts for 21.5% uh, of my income, which is a huge increase. It's over double. Uh, I have, however, got some more points on that later. Okay, so for the last quadrant then, the book sales, in year one, book sales accounted for 17% of my income, and this year they accounted for 46% of my income. So almost half my income is book sales. And of course, you know, <laughs> you would hope that that would be the case seeing as I, uh, you know, primarily I write books, obviously I do lots of other things, but that's really important to me. I, I don't know how how high I want that percentage to go. I think most of you will recall that when I was in the day job, the last two years, I was uh, uh, under threat of redundancy no less than four times. And so I have always come to this business wanting my income to be from very diverse models. So I'm really happy with that. Maybe I will push for it to be 50%. I don't know. Um, but I would like to think that if it continues to grow, that I would maybe add some other kind of passive income. Maybe we buy a second property or I do some investments. I have been trying to pluck up the balls or the vagina to go and do investments. So... Um, yeah, like I am sure lots of you want 100% of your income from book sales and that's okay, I don't. I don't want to be solely reliant on one source of income. So I'm really happy with this. Uh, it, the book sales increased 2% on last year. So last year they accounted for 44%. This year they accounted for 46%, which is interesting because they the 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 if you looked at the actual figures, they increased a lot this year. <laughs> So um, it's, but I think it's reflective of the fact that my overall income increased so significantly this year. And of course, I don't really know numbers. I don't really understand it. I just did the math and this is how it comes out. So I just accept the math as what it is. Um, so I wanted to, I think I told you my main income streams last year. So I'm going to tell you again, and I'm going to tell you in the order of the size. So book sales, as I said, accounted for 46% of my income. Freelance is my second biggest portion, which accounts for 32 and a half percent, then course sales and then the podcast, which encaptures uh, everything. So uh, Patreon sponsorships, all of that kind of stuff, then affiliate income, then speaking and consulting. And the smallest uh, p uh, bit is merchandise. So I think I've probably shrunk that. I feel like maybe I've shrunk that. I can't quite put my finger on what has gone. Uh, but definitely I'm not doing a lot of stuff. So uh, yeah, and I will, that will probably stay the same, I suspect, this coming year. Although, actually, no, I'm not going to tell you that because we'll talk about that later. Okay, so in the show notes, I have included a list of uh, the assets from year one, year two, and year three. So this year, I my assets in my business include eight nonfiction books, three nonfiction box sets, four fiction books, one audiobook, and two courses. And of course, I secured a deal for Korean translation rights on the existing nonfiction. Now, I had eight nonfiction books last year, which is weird because obviously I have published nonfiction this year. But what basically what happened is that the collaborative books that I did with Jay Thorne have been pulled. And I believe that Jay is remaking them into something new. So although it looks like my nonfiction has remained stationary, I did publish two, well, I, I published a textbook and a, and a workbook this year. This tax year, so year 2020, what year are we? <laughs> 2022 to 2023, I plan to add 
four non-fiction books, so two textbooks and two workbooks. The first textbook that I am doing uh, is almost finished and that's called The Anatomy of a Bestseller and that is essentially teaching you how to deconstruct uh, the books that you're reading, the best-selling books in your genre, what to look for, uh, what that means for your writing and um, yeah, I'm really super excited. There's some other bits about looking at the market as well. Um, and what else? Uh... Yeah, there'll be another book after that. I don't know that I quite want to talk about it yet. I'm working on an Enemies to Lovers Tropes course as well. Um, and I will be working on lots and lots of fiction this coming year as well. Annoyingly, um, although I've added two fiction books this year, I have got a novella, a third novella, but it is being published after the year the the three the third year ends so I'm not counting it because it feels like cheating uh which is annoying for this year but also a benefit for next year because I start one up of course I also ho hope to add another audiobook I'm hoping that this one will be significantly quicker to do <laughs> and complete and I will be starting that relatively soon uh probably before the summer I think with the aim of getting it out towards the end of the year in doing this review, I also realised <laughs> that I should have had another box set out this year. I should have had the side characters box set out. And for whatever reason, <laughs> I just completely blanked that. So I haven't done that and I need to do that. So that's probably something I will be doing over the next couple of weeks. Uh, they don't take an awful long time. It's just an additional product. It's the same material, essentially. It's just in a box set because some people prefer the box set. Um... So yeah, okay, so what is my main takeaway? What is my first takeaway? What is the first thing that I have learned? Well, takeaway one is that I maintain last year's stance. This annual review is ridiculously helpful in giving me perspective and giving me the opportunity to look back at the last year. I'm not very good at looking back. I tend to keep my eyes focused on the goal and charging forward. And so, yeah, it's not wildly helpful because I then don't see all of the things that I have achieved. So, I will continue to do these reviews. I will do another one towards the end of April next year. Um, more to the point, I think it also helps me remember what the priorities are. So I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail in a different lesson. But doing this has reminded me that my focus does waver. I can get distracted. Um, and so, yes, keeping my focus and giving myself the space to look at this uh, really does help that. All right. Lesson two. I fucking hate this lesson for what it's worth. <laughs> you can't do everything. Dot, dot, dot. Sasha is probably how that should end. But you can't do everything. It physically pains me to say that, that to you. And I'm not, like, maybe more specifically, it's not that I'm saying you can't do everything, but I can't do everything. I genuinely swan about thinking that there are no limits and boundaries. And then every fucking so often when I smack head first, knock myself out on a wall, a concrete wall, a hard stop boundary, I'm reminded that apparently there are in fact boundaries and limits to our personal capacities. <sighs> okay, I am joking and, and being silly, but you know, of all of the years in business, I feel like this year has felt like the biggest leap in terms of development, income wise, mindset wise, personal self development. And in a way, it's been a maturing of sorts as well, and kind of empowering, um, settling into the business and knowing that I really can do it. I can, but also realizing that if I want to, and if I want to make money, then I have got to fucking focus on the right things. Which leads me to my point. I spent, I think about eight months of this past year, this third year, cutting back, hacking jobs out, saying no to stuff, quitting projects, not quitting projects, but like quitting, quitting commitments, or completing commitments, I should say. I don't think I let anybody down. I managed to not let anybody down. But, you know, saying no after I have um, 
completed things so that nothing else goes onto my plate. Um, and despite, you know, I, despite, like, what am I trying to say here? I, I still feel like I added a lot of stuff. I created a lot of assets last year, even though I was finding myself wildly overwhelmed and doing too much. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, but I definitely found that I was spending too much time doing jobs and tasks and little promises for other people. Things like, oh, you know, just helping somebody here or helping somebody there or um, over committing to reading blur uh, reading books and providing blurbs or over promising on the speaking commitments or over promising, I don't know, just over promising taking on volunteering things, additional stuff. And it's not all writing either, right? You know, I'm, I do this in my real life, real life, <laughs> my, my day life, wait, my, my personal life. That's the word. Oh my God. COVID has like racked my brain of, of all the words. Anyway. Um, so yeah, like I overcommitted, I made too many little promises and I don't like to disappoint people. So, you know, I, I definitely got to a point last year where I felt like for the first time since leaving my day job, my business felt like a job. And I don't want a job. I want a lifestyle. I want a career. I want my own business. And I don't want my business to feel like a fucking job. That is exactly why I left the day job. So that wasn't what I wanted, which is why I committed to spending you know, I sacrificed last year, in essence, I committed to getting rid of anything and everything that wasn't core to my business. And those eight grueling months, I feel were really well spent. Like I said, I've delivered on the commitments and the promise. And now I am saying no to stuff. Now I'm saying no left, right and centre. I'm doing less of the things that I feel don't have as significant of a return on investment. I'm trying to put boundaries in place. I'm trying to spend less time on social media, less time, like, I don't want to say less time communicating because that's not really what I mean. Like, obviously I do this podcast, which is a form of communication, but I am definitely trying to spend less time communicating on social media because... <sighs> I would do that during my working day and, you know, surprising no one on the days where I just don't reply, <laughs> I get loads of words done. I mean, shocking, fucking shocking revelation that. And I don't really know why it's taken me this long to really realise or learn that lesson because I knew it, like I knew, but I didn't know. And there is a difference between knowing and knowing. So yeah, I... I find this putting boundaries in place really difficult. I am definitely triggered by like notifications. I feel the urge to reply. I don't like letting people down. I don't like saying no. <sighs> yeah, I want to help everyone. I really genuinely am driven to help people. I'm driven to help writers, but I have realized this year that I physically, mentally, emotionally, and quite literally cannot help everybody and in order to help the most people possible and do that in a way that still keeps me sane and keeps some time for self-care and for my family then I have to focus on the projects that will deliver the biggest amount of help if that makes sense so to me that's writing books creating courses producing audio in the last 18 months, I do feel like there's been a shift in the amount of help wanted versus how much I can physically do. And that has been made way more difficult by the pandemic. And the fact that I do have a child who's at an age where he still needs me. And we've also had some difficulties um, that he has needed extra time and emotional uh, headspace for. And that has kind of caused me to shift and 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 it's pushed pushed me mentally to a pain point because I of course will always prioritize my son and my wife over everything else but there is a very large significant part of me the core of me is an achiever and is competitive and that means that 
that is how I love myself, right? I love myself by allowing myself to do the work or giving myself the space to do work and to be competitive and to strive harder and longer and bigger. That is how I give myself love. That is what makes me feel loved when I give myself the space to do that and to focus on the right things. But I am also aware that I have reached the physical limit of my capacity this past year. And so that has pushed me to refocus and question what is most important. Like, I don't feel like I ever questioned what was important before this year because I wasn't pushed to that physical and mental pain point. And it's kind of annoying that I had to get to that pain point in order to question and in order to really be able to look and reflect on what was important. I don't quite know why I had to get to that physical pain point in order to do that. But I am glad that I have gotten there because it is enabling me to realise what is important and what I value. I think the worst thing about this lesson is that despite having learned it partway through last year, (laughs) I've just had to relearn it. Like, I shit you not. Obviously, I went through those eight months of, of doing work. And then the early part of this year... I had a patch where I overcommitted again. And I like I was literally like, Sasha, what the f- actual fuck are you doing? Anyway, suffice to say, I'm through the other side now and I am focusing on getting words and getting books done. And guess what? I'm significantly happier. Fucking surprise, shocking revelation that. Like, honestly, I it's beyond me why sometimes we have to relearn these things. But so takeaway two for me is that it is hard to get perspective when you're in the depths of running your business. I have been trying to give myself more headspace and more thinking time. And I think that that has enabled me to see the road that I was going down and that I didn't like that road and pivot. At the end of this year... What do you want to have achieved? Do you want to have produced 200 Instagram posts? Or do you want to have written another book? These are the questions I am asking myself. Like maybe you guys want to set up a mailing list or maybe you want to improve your marketing. Maybe it's time to have a look at your autoresponders. But you can't do everything. You cannot do everything. So what do you actually want to achieve? What is the important thing? And that is a great segue into lesson three. Lesson three is focus where the money is. So this came out of lesson one for me, which was the income update. And I'm kind of mad at myself. Like, I'm resigned that, you know, I am I obviously needed to go through the last year in order to get to where I am. But nothing moves fast until, like, everything moves fast. So last year, I noted uh, in my annual update that my books were generating the biggest income for me. They, I think last year I said they were 44%, this year they're 46%. And... <laughs> Therefore, that is where I should be focusing my time. But did I do that? No. No, I fucking didn't. (gasps) Internal screaming! (laughs) Like, cue me rocking in the corner, having to relearn the same fucking bullshit lessons every single fucking year. (sighs) Look, okay, I did make some headway towards it because... In order to make headway, I had to clear the decks, right? And we've already talked about that, the fact that I did that. So no, I didn't get to focus on it, but I did do the work in order to, for me to spend time focusing on it. So I feel like even though I didn't run through the finishing line, I did, let's say I've hit the wall, maybe like I hit mile 18 in a marathon, like I did most of the work. So that's good. But basically, for the love of literary fucking gods, I have got to focus on the right things. I have got to spend the vast majority of my time on the things that make me the most money, which is books and courses. If you want to earn more money, then you focus on the highest earners, right? Rather than spending 60 to 70% on my time, on the everything else bucket, which only brings in 21% or whatever it was of my income, like that is illogical. It is illogical to spend 60 to 70% of my time on the thing that brings in less than a quarter of my income. 
why am I doing that? Like, stop it. So I am, I am stopping it. My good friend Katie uh, Forrest sent me a kind of plaque that says 2022, the year of no, and it is attached to my whiteboard. It is really precious to me. I love it so much because it is a daily reminder that I have permission to say no. So, yes, I am... I have learned that I need to spend more time on the heavy earners so that I can expect to earn more overall. And therefore, that is what I'm going to be focusing my time on this year as well. Um, I've got plans for courses. Like I've mentioned, I've already started the Enemies to Lovers course. And um, yeah, I am going to prioritise words. The other thing that I have to give myself permission to do And this is really important. And I feel like this is a lesson that I've had to continually fucking learn as well, is that I need permission to do the work that enables me to write that isn't physical word writing. So for example, I need permission to outline, to input and read, to do mood boards, to do research, to do brainstorming. I need to give myself permission to proofread my books during the day. Like it literally took for me to get COVID um, and to be put on my ass for me to go, you know, I just don't have the energy to work all day and then proof in the evening. Because you know what that equates to? That equates to working all day and then working all fucking night too. So... (laughs) Go figure, go figure why I didn't count that as like working all fucking day, 20 fucking four hours a day, but it is. Anyway, so in doing that proofing um, on, I can't remember what it was, Monday last week, I think now, I really was like, oh, like this is actually working. (laughs) How did I not think that was working? I don't know, but it was working. So, and it felt really good to be doing that in the middle of the day. I felt like I, the, like that I was a publisher because that's what I am. So yeah, I don't really know why I find it so excruciatingly difficult to give myself the time to do this type of work, but I really need to get a fucking grip because it is work. And things like outlining and inputting and research are the foundations that will enable me to write faster, right? Because I'm trying to squeeze those bits of work in the in-between hours, in the the 10 minutes here, the 15 minutes there. And it's not enough. I'm just adding loads of pressure on myself when, you know, I have the power or maybe I have the power now that I've cleared the decks, right? So I'm coming at this from a privileged point of view because maybe I wasn't giving myself that time because I actually didn't really have the fucking time. Uh, But you have to make the time, right? Anyway, here's me committing to and saying that I am going to be giving myself the time to do the foundational work in order to get my fucking job done. So takeaway three then is first to focus the majority of your time on whichever aspect of your business earns the most. Second, the shit around wording is also work and you have permission to do that in your allotted creative times. That is all. Lesson four, be a better publisher. Indie authors, as you well know, are also publishers. We're writers, we're marketers, we're fucking everything else cutters. You know, we are all of the hats. But here's the thing. When you're actually a good publisher, it makes a difference. This year, I decided to try and be better at being a publisher. As opposed to being a publisher by default, I was choosing to be a publisher. So this meant that I had to work on the stuff that doesn't necessarily smack of fun, but was over the long haul really important because it would bring me more income. It makes you look more professional and it ultimately did your bi- does your business and did my business the world of good. So some of the things I did were spending some time studying how to write better blurbs. So I rewrote all of my blurbs. I experimented with new promotional mechanisms like free, like I'd never done a free run. So I wanted to see what that would do. Uh, I updated my front and back matter. 
I wrote a reader magnet, I updated files on stores, I created a brand kit, I um, created some templates, I... Yeah, what else did I do? Loads of things. Okay, so the other things that are that now I am in the process of ensuring that all of my books are in all formats. So for example, I've got like a couple of hardbacks for one thing and then, but like not for everything else. And then like I've got um, in process large prints. I've got box sets for some shit, no box sets for other. I've got some books that are only eBooks and no paperbacks. So I'm trying to standardize everything across the board. This last chunk is the hardest chunk because obviously there's like a financial cost to uh, doing that. Um, but so I suspect it will probably take me another year or two to get fully standardized, but I am trying and I am trying to be better at doing consistent promotions as well. So I need to finish off this project, as I've just said, with making sure the formats are all standards. Like, as I mentioned earlier on as well, realizing that I didn't have the box set for side characters at all. Like, I don't know what happened there. Um, and the last thing really is I need to write a new set of autoresponders for my fiction because I'm changing the direction my fiction is going in. And I need to check my uh, nonfiction autoresponders as well. So yeah, those are jobs for me this year. So takeaway four is that you have to be a good publisher. And sometimes that means doing the donkey work and updating the metadata, the back end stuff, checking your categories, your keywords, thinking about your books as products. But you know, in doing that, you are for sure going to increase your income. And uh, off the back of this kind of promotional stuff that I've done with the free run and uh, completing the series, I am going to bring you some numbers and uh, I will let you all know once it's all complete and uh, I sort of got the fallout from what I earned from it, I will, yeah, I will let you guys know how it went. Lesson five then is that <laughs> human connection is necessary but also difficult. This is perhaps the weirdest and most unexpected lesson for me. I have always been absolutely fine with working at home. And in fact, the first year I was practically delirious uh, about working at home. I was so happy. <laughs> I was like, fuck people, fuck being in a team, fuck this, fuck that, fuck everything. Um, but then, when I left my day job, I had a network around me. I still lived close to our friends. I still lived close to the people that I used to work with. I still lived close to the people I'd gone to university with. Roll on the pandemic and an 85 plus mile away move, house move, uh, that equated to the loss of basically my entire network. So over the course of the pandemic, I more or less stopped talking to everybody that I used to work with. So like, I haven't seen anybody that I used to work with since I left. Um, oh no, that's not quite true. I would say I haven't seen anybody that I used to work with since the pandemic. Um, and then like I've got a handful of long-term friends, but they are scattered all over the world. Like my oldest friend lives in Australia. I've got really close writing friends who live in America and New Zealand, which is great. It's fantastic. And trust me, I fucking adore them, but they live miles away and I want them here. Like, and I can't do that. That's selfish. So yeah, like I do have some friends in the UK. Of course, I still got some friends that are where I used to live uh, over an hour away. And we do make the effort, we do travel. But of course, in order to see them, it is an effort and we do have to travel. And so we don't see them as regularly as we used to when they were close. And the pandemic has not helped that either. So the consequence is that my social circle has reduced to more or less nothing. 99% uh, of the time, I'm okay with that. Like, I am super fucking busy and, you know, I don't really have a lot of time to be sociable. Um, and of course, work brings me a deep sense of joy and a deep satisfaction. And I derive a lot of joy out of my work because this I chose this. It's not like a day job anymore that I ended up in. I chose this. I'm building and creating this. This is where I get a lot of my joy from. 
Um, you know, and of course I do have the friends who, are the couple of friends that I spend, vo- you know, all day, every day, voice memo, not all day, every day, that's complete like because we all focus and we are badass like work machines. But, you know, I do. I voice memo a couple of people um, on a, on the regular basis. And that really makes a difference. Like that has saved me, I think, through the pandemic. And I would be lost without them. So that like, that lifeline means everything to me. So thank you, ladies. You know who you are. Um... But of late, I have noticed that I have the desire to just go for a coffee with someone or just like go for dinner or drinks or whatever. But there's this weird, I don't know, what's the word? COVID brain dichotomy? Is that what I mean? Well, like, I don't know whether it's just me or whether it's the consequence of the pandemic and getting really comfortable at home. But like, I'm finding it really difficult to summon the energy to actually be sociable. I'm finding that my social anxiety is like a hundred times worse than it has ever been. I have always had social anxiety. Um, are you, I wish you could see me. I'm literally like, I am sat my body language right now, even talking about this. I am rubbing my hands under my desk because I'm so uncomfortable talking about this. But like, I feel that it's really important to tell you the truth and to explain where I am like and I'm okay like I'm totally okay I'm not saying that like I'm woe is me or anything but I have this strange conflict inside me where I want to widen my social circle just as much as I really can't think of anything worse than having to widen my social circle so that's leaving me in a bit of a quandary because I am saying no to things that I should go and do like I'm saying no to social events that I'm I should just go and do but I I I'm finding it very very hard and I don't know how to widen my social circle like I've forgotten how to make friends I know it sounds ridiculous but it's true like nobody tells you how hard it is to make friends as an adult and being in a completely new area like It is hard as well because the mum groups here, they are very established because their kids have been there for God knows how many years. And we came in at at a point with the school where everybody still had to wear masks. So the first year of me being here, I didn't know what anybody looked like. I only recognized them by their eyeballs. So yeah, I mean, of course, you know, we're not wearing masks anymore, but also, I don't know. The one thing that I do know from writing and business is that your network is so precious and valuable. Every time I widen my net, my business network, which by the way, I have no issues with doing, I seem to not mind widening my business network and there's much less anxiety around that than there is having to widen my social circle. Um, it, 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 you know, your network is so important. So I know that I need to do something about this because... I don't know. Like, I'm just so fucking awkward. I'm shy to small talk and I don't really, I don't want to do small talk, but also nobody wants to talk about writing unless you're in writing. And I'm not saying that's the only thing I want to talk about, but I do find it difficult when the only conversation is like reality TV people or like famous people. I'm just like, I don't give a fuck about any of that. So I don't know how to have those conversations and that's how you get to the deeper conversations. So yeah, look, I'm fine, but I'm also aware that working for yourself when you work at home and not in a co-working space can really isolate you and I think this was heightened by the period when I didn't have the internet for a month and I went to the co-working space (laughs) and I remember texting my wife and being like babe someone just smiled at me and she was like I don't I don't get it. Like, what is okay? Like, okay. And I'm like, what do you mean, okay? Someone smiled at me. And she was just like, I don't understand your point. Like, what are you going on about, Sasha? And uh, anyway, so yeah, like it was just a realization that teams exist and you can work with people. And so yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I think that my takeaway, my takeaway five is that I need to suck my shit up and just get on with it and be a bit more sociable. Lesson six, your uniqueness is everything. More and more, I see and understand why uniqueness is everything. It's taken me a long time to figure out who I am, what I stand for, 
and like what it is that makes my books, my stories and my voice unique. And I think it's one of the most important things that you can do for your business because the way you make money is by niching down, right? You have to choose a niche, you have to choose an aisle, a column, a road that you are gonna walk down and then you walk down it for as long as humanly fucking possible. And that is how you pick up as many um, readers as possible. It reminds me a little bit of um, uh, Tom Hanks in Forrest Gump and Forrest runs from one side of America to the other. And by the time he gets like across one side, he has a fucking legion of people following him. And, you know, when he gets to the other side, it's even bigger, right? And all he did was he just carried on down the same road. And that is what I am realizing about branding and niche and being the most you possible and embracing that is that you need to stick to your lane. Like everybody talks about it, but nobody really talks about why it's important. And I think that is why it's important. And the moment I understood that was the moment I realized I could lean in. And I feel like that is something that has happened this year. Every time I've understood a little piece of me better, I've leaned in and I have seen positive results. And okay, everybody drink, but some of this is about strengths. If you've listened to this show for any amount of time, you will have heard of me talk about Clifton strengths and probably heard me, uh, you know, waxing lyrical about how much I love Becca Syme. It has been a wild fucking ride, guys. I, I have a lot of what are called influencing strengths. And it just so happens that those are the most often misunderstood strengths. And of course, the foremost being competition, which as you know, is my number one strength. And I kind of swing roundabouts about this. Every time it gets misunderstood, it really hurts. Like, and this is probably my significance, like my fragile little ego. But like, I, I, when it get, does get hurt, I just want to crawl into my shell and not embrace my strength anymore. But that's bad because every time I'm leaning into my strength, I feel like I'm embracing what is my superpower. And that is a good thing because it's enabling me to push my business as far as I can. Every time I realize something about a natural talent or a natural, um, a a thing that I'm naturally good at, if I lean into it, I work faster, I work better. I clear out the barriers and the blockages that enable me to yeah, just like write better, write faster, write bigger, do everything bigger and better. I think it also goes deeper though than just strengths. And um, if you followed Next Level Authors, the the other podcast that I used to co-host, then you will have heard me have my sort of come to Jesus moment over the last 18 months where I understood the type of fiction that I really wanted to write. I don't really understand how I didn't realize that I wanted to write queer books, but the fact of the matter is that I didn't realize that. And I think some of that was not accepting some of my strengths, not accepting some of who I was. Like, of course I accepted that I was queer, uh, you know, (laughs) otherwise I wouldn't have married a woman or had a baby. Um, But in not accepting pieces of myself, I'm not true to myself. And that means I hide things from myself. And so, yeah, like, I feel like I finally found the right path for me. And while I can't know that this is what I'll want to do forever, and I can't know that this will, I don't know, keep me happy forever, right now it feels right. And nothing has ever felt this right before. And that feels good. That that for me feels like it can only spell good things for the future. And life is nothing if not a journey, right? I, I, I also think that this has had an impact in other ways for me. So like in accepting those parts of me, I'm also finally starting to realize that after however many books I've fucking written, I actually have a consistent writing process I know, I fucking know, it's shocking. I am shocked by this revelation because I have spent definitely the last year searching for an explanation or something that was kind of like a written process, something in stone um, that I could point to and say, hey, that's me, that's what I do. This is me who fucking hates boxes as well, people. Can we just like laugh at the irony of this? But um, 
you know, I think it's taken me 12 to 15 books to really realize what my writing, writing process is. But in accepting it, I'm speeding up. Like rather than fighting the methods that I just need to employ in order to get to the end of the draft, I'm just fucking doing it. And guess what? I'm writing faster. I, it sounds insane. Like saying this, it sounds ridiculous. Like, of course, duh, you just work the way you need to. Like, and then you get the books done. But do you? But do any of us, do any of us really accept that it is the way that it is? No, I don't fucking think that any of us do. It's hard accepting that we are the way that we are. And like, despite being in this industry for God knows how long, I definitely was still subscribing to like what I thought in air quotes should be my process. Well, fuck that. My first draft is officially called a chaos draft. And knowing that, and like embracing that is just making everything so much easier. The other realization that I've had, <laughs> and this is so fucking stupid, I just can't believe it's taken me this long to work it out. I write fiction and nonfiction in exactly the same way. Like it's the literal same process. Oh, Sasha, <laughs> you dear sweet naive child. So, yeah, I don't know. Where is that leaving me? It is leaving me so freaking excited to see where the rest of this year is going to go, to see what I am capable of now that I know these things, that I'm embracing a process that works for me. So takeaway six, you, my dear listener, are beautiful. Embrace you. Fuck what they say. Fuck what anyone says. Find what works for you. Find your thang, your angle, your hook, the thing that makes you uniquely you. And then lean like a very fucking drunk sailor into that motherfucker and just go for it. I have one last thought for you. And this is the same thought that I always have every year. And it's the same thought that I end with. No matter what happens, this is better. I say this every year and I hope that this is an on-running like mantra that I say for the rest of my days. Because if it is, then I've done my job. I created the life that I wanted. I keep two photos. The first is a post-it that I carried and I signed it and I put it in my wallet and I carried it forever or what felt like forever. Every day when I went to the coffee queue for like, let's be honest, the fourth time just because I needed to get out of the office again, I would see the post-it as I went to pay for my coffee. And it was a constant reminder. The post-it said, I will be writing full-time in 2020. And I thought that's how long it would take me. I thought that I wouldn't get to work for myself until 2020, but by a fucking miracle and, you know, the offer of, a, uh, you know, a reliable freelance gig, I was able to cross that out and write 2019 and leave the day job in 2019. Crossing that out and handing my notice in is still one of the greatest days of my whole life. The other photo though is full of pain and I hate looking at it and I only ever look at it when I do this post because it is a annual reminder of the lowest point in my life. I took that photo in the office. I was actually in the office and that was what I looked like. You can go to the show notes to, to have a look. And like, I don't really know what possessed me to take that photo because I looked fucking rough. But I am so glad that I took it. It is so painful for me to look at and remember that that was the pain that I was in. I genuinely feel like I look older in that photo than I look now. And I think like it's easy now, three years out, now that I'm healed mentally, to forget what it was like and the mental anguish that I was in. Like I was suffering. I was crippled mentally. And I don't actually think that I've said this out loud, but if I look back, I think I was probably, probably suffering clinical depression. Um, 
you know, I didn't go to a doctor's and I probably should have done, but, you know, we I talked about this with my wife and she agrees that she thinks that I was depressed at that point. Um, all I cared about, all I could focus on was getting out. And I've like never really talked about it very much, but I definitely had a lot of dark thoughts whilst I was working in the corporate world. And what saved me was this low laser focus on one thing and one thing only, and that was getting out and living the dream. But it kind of took being in the darkest place I've ever been to push the hardest I've ever pushed. And it's a strange juxtaposition that really, but I really believe that writing saved my life. So that is why I keep the photo. That is why I look at it every year, because when I write this post, I have to ask myself, do I want to be back there? And fuck no, I really do not. <laughs> but like this life, this fucking vagina busting, exhaustion inducing, utterly mesmerizing, awe-inspiring, creatively fulfilled life is so much better. Yes, I work more hours than I have ever worked in my entire life. Yes, I have to make constant sacrifices, but you know what? I will never go back, not ever. I choose me, I choose this life, because no matter what, this life is better. And so I just want to say to you, like, if you are in a dark place or if you are in a day job and you are desperate to get out, like you can do it. You can do it. I am just a regular everyday girl and I fought hard. I had a laser focus and I fought hard and, and I did it and I got out. And if I can get out, you can get out too. You have to find what it is that you are good at. Lean into it. Write all of the fucking words. Learn the marketing. I know it's a lot, but I believe that you guys can do it too. And for those who are already full time, you fucking did it. Like everybody, let's go have some gin. Uh, and yeah, like Take the time to celebrate those wins. Take the time to look back on your last year. And I would love to know, like, what lesson have you learned over the last year? What lesson have you learned since the beginning of your writing journey? What have you learned if you are full time? What have you learned in the X number of years that you have been full time? And yeah, that is where I'm gonna leave you. I hope that you guys have a wonderful writing week. I hope that you found this useful. <laughs> I hope that you found my reflections interesting and I will see you next week. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.